Well, good afternoon. And once again, totally excited. Uh, I have Dr. Marie Ginsberg here. She has created uh, something called Reading Simplified. And uh, one of my friends on uh, uh, Twitter made me aware of it. And I started looking and started liking what I was seeing. Uh, so I think she's got a lot of interesting things to share. I'll start by asking you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background. Well, thank you, Dr. Sam. It's great to be here. I am a literacy consultant. I've created two reading programs and I got started as a public school teacher. Actually, it was middle school and high school trained, but when my students weren't able to read the words, that's when I kind of adjusted and got obsessed with how we teach reading. And that was in the late nineties. So I've been obsessed about it ever since. And um, it led me to grad school, which in grad school, then I had the weird opportunity to, to develop a uh, intervention for K-1 struggling readers. It was called the targeted reading in intervention. Now they're calling it targeted reading in in instruction, but it's on the What Works Clearinghouse. And we got good effects for um, struggling readers in those K and one classrooms, even though we were in challenging low income rural communities. So that was a really watershed moment in my career. We were, it was exciting to see the results, but at the same time, um, it didn't leak out. And isn't that the case so often with research? <laughs> the researchers do all that work and a lot of it just stays on the shelf collecting dust. So. I then decided to try something more grassroots, and that led me to develop Reading Simplified, which I got the idea for actually about 10 years ago. And I've been doing that, trying to disseminate an idea about how to teach reading in a streamlined fashion that really works for all learners and accelerates reading. I've been doing that for 10 years. Hey, uh, that is just uh, many of my listeners are practicing teachers and they're always up for, Hey, I need more information. And you got to know, you have got to send me the link to that, uh, what works clearing house, uh, 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 business and, uh, what a wonderful background. Well, uh, Thank you. now, um, tell us now if we were to go on your reading simplified, uh, site, um, You've already given us a little idea of how it came to be. What kind of resources could we find? I, I, I thought I got an email about free decodables. You know what I'm saying? So, and it, everybody's looking for are, those, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My teachers are free. Free always will catch a teacher's attention. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what we might find on your site? Sure, I would be glad to. Um, ReadingSimplified.com is where we share a streamlined approach for the teaching of reading, and we offer a lot of complimentary resources, a lot of videos and word lists, how to's, how to respond to kids reading errors. So if you're a person who works with a beginning reader or a, actually a reader of any age who struggles when we're talking about recognizing words or fluency, then we have a system for you. So like I said, there's a lot of complimentary resources there. We also have some of the similar resources on our YouTube channel. But if you want to go deep and learn the full system, then we have what we call the Reading Simplified Academy. And that's where we offer training in this Reading Simplified system. And it's a way of thinking about how to teach kids how to decode so that they can then learn to recognize words automatically so that then they can become fluent. And it's intended to be streamlined both in terms of what the teacher needs to learn and then how she disseminates that or, or, or teaches her students. So it's not just a system about how we teach reading. It's also um, just a handful of activities, which is part of the way in which we streamline things. It's just not an a, actually, you know, we're as teachers, we're always grabbing for more and more stuff. Um, but having so many choices is, is also overwhelming. <laughs> so we have a streamlined system. And then we provide, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of decodable resources. 
and, and word lists as well, decodable text for multiple grade levels, whether you're reading at the kindergarten grade, grade level or reading at the fifth grade level. And then finally, another really important part that I'm proud of is that we have ongoing coaching. So if you're a member of the Reading Simplified Academy, you don't just learn our system at your own pace in our video training. You also get daily support in our discussion, um, discussion board, online discussion board. We call it the Teacher's Lounge. So you don't have to figure out how to implement this new idea on your own. This is the no more drive by PD. We all research has demonstrated very, very roundly, quite roundly that that doesn't work. Right. And so um, whether you have just time to dip in and try one of our, our most popular and impactful, easy to pick up activities called switch it, you can do that for free at our website at readingsimplified.com, or you can um, get training and to learn the full system and get all of our decodable resources and that ongoing coaching inside the Reading Simplified Academy. Oh, hey, uh, I was leaning over taking notes, I hope you noticed. Yeah. And, uh, I, uh, I've i got a couple of places where it's like, need link, need link, need link. I want to make sure that there's a link. All the big things that you mentioned. I, I got the notes too. Uh, my, my, my readers and listeners, uh, I promise you there will be links to all that. Uh, very easy to do. Okay. Uh, you have a blog. And I've read a couple of things about the blog. I'm going to do the next one out of order. Um, I just loved your handout about key research. And uh, I wonder if you could bring that up and talk to us about it. And especially talk to us about why you uh, put in what you put in and, uh, uh, and what a reader might find uh, out about the research by looking at that. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, this has been on my mind to um, to develop for a long time. I finally just bit the bullet um, because we're in this strange time where the science of reading movement is gaining strength and um, some people are diving in into the deep end and other people may not have even heard of it. Um, some people are interested, but there's uh, they're also resisting and it's just hard to catch up. <laughs> if you have been in the field, you haven't been taught this information. Generally, most of us haven't um, at the university level. And then it's not often discussed uh, up you know, prior to the science of reading movement. So I, I just wanted people to know that this notion um, specifically that how the brain learns to read how, to, how the brain learns to read words, especially that we've had a long thread of that research. And um, we've had meta-analyses, which are like studies where researchers take averages, as you know, Sam, of lots of studies mm -hmm. and sort of average it. Um, and then we've had literature reviews where they researchers take summaries and integrate it in their own analytical thinking. And then we've just had major papers, watershed documents, watershed individual authors have also written major book. So that's what I was trying to, to represent here with this actually, and this is page one, say page two, it starts actually in 1967. Sorry, I should have started. That. Wow. Okay. It doesn't actually, you know, it doesn't start in 1967, but that's the one um, that is so well known. Um, if you have been reading the, re the reading research for years, but if you haven't, and you've been busy teaching kids, everything bes besides art, math, you know, <laughs> reading science and being the nurse and the social worker as well, you haven't had time to read all this. So I just wanted a quick um, place to go and you can hyperlink from these, um, each of these seminal documents to go and read it in depth. Or if you want to just see a little snippet from, um, from what I thought was particularly relevant with regard to this issue about how the kids learn to read words or how our brain learns to read words, then there was, um, and, you know, a little element for each one. For instance, with Dr. Jean Shaw, who is from Harvard, she um, concluded in her really famous learning to read the great debate book in 1967, the great debate, you know, <laughs> we're still debating it. Uh, but she wrote a code emphasis tends to produce overall reading achievement, better overall reading achievement by the beginning of fourth grade than a meaning emphasis. So we've known this for a while, but we have been, um, um, confused. And it, as the science of reading movement get, comes out, 
this should be really well known. We can look to see, you know, these are these other very influential documents. Now, many of these have many other very important points. I'm kind of just taking a narrow slice because uh, a lot of what I think the science of reading debate has been about, um, not all of it, but a lot of it is at that word level. Like, what do we do with three queuing? What do we do with phonics? Um, and so to know that at least there's some evidence for three queuing isn't the way that we can get the best bang for our buck. Um, that is what is intended by these documents. So um, I, yeah, I would love to have people check it out on our website. You can get your own copy of it, click to, you know, click through to something if it's of interest to read it further. There's, and, and not only are these, you know, important because of their, emphasis about word level information. They have a lot of other really important findings in them, but that was, I was just taking that one slice because frankly, there's a lot in reading research, isn't there? We could spend years. Yeah. <laughs> and actually some of us have. <laughs> right. Well, that was what I was trying to do. It was like, okay, you want to learn about the science of reading, but you don't have time to go get a master's. Maybe you could look at this and find things that are relevant to you. Go take little, go on little rabbit trails on to explore what appeals to you as an, maybe a new person to the field and then get a better sense about what researchers are saying. So when researchers make these, you know, um, grandiose claims, you can know that it's not just one dude's opinion. Okay. Okay. Well, if we could switch back over to normal again, and I'm going to do this side by side. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to go to, so, so, I think I'm going to go side by side. Here we go. <laughs> Gallery. There we are. Okay. Um, so but I'll just, I'll just put in a, a quick plug for myself. Uh, this weekend, I'm sorry, this interview won't run for a week after, until after this weekend. So uh, that's when it will run. And this weekend, I'll be delving into exactly what you're talking about and looking at all the sides. Might be a slightly different take than the one we just heard, but not that different. And, uh, you know, I'd love, to, love for you to read it and the uh, okay. opinion of it. Uh, it'll be coming out Saturday morning, everybody. Well, but actually, by the time people see this, uh, it will have already come out. But uh, I'll make sure to have a link to it uh, in the blog. Okay, so sorry, I had to do my own little promo, so promo there. All right. Uh, another thing you talked about is the, um, and I think that this is an incredibly important thing that people should be aware of, is developing that uh, set for variability. So could you tell us a little bit about what you said in your blog about that? Well, I had the opportunity to get on um, the Measured Moms podcast, Triple R Teaching and share a little bit about set for variability. So if you want to go there and listen to it, that's one way to do it. Also, we we wrote oh, up. Wrote give me up, the link and it'll be there. It'll, yeah, <laughs> we also wrote up um, the, uh, the main ideas that, that I was trying to express. So there is this really new, cool thing that researchers have been studying. It's called set for variability, which is a mouthful. Another way of thinking about it would be uh, mispronunciation correction. So if the child comes to the word um, bread and they say breed, how, how do they adjust from that? Well, that adjustment, if they are able to do it on their own, or maybe with just a little prompting from a teacher or a parent, that adjustment is a, as a, is a correction of a mispronunciation, right? And so they, they read it as uh, breed, and I'm meaning as in, I want to eat, use the bread for, with my ham and cheese. So maybe that wasn't the best <laughs> example because that word actually has, um, is a homophone, right? So anyway, if they re read the word bread as breed and they should realize, and it doesn't fit in the context of ham and cheese and the sandwich and yada, yada, then they need to correct it. They need to realize even probably subconsciously, something needs to change there with that vowel sound. And I'm going to find another word that's meaningful that fits that EA pattern. Oh, it could be bread. Oh, it's in dead. Or um, I read the book. So that is a strategy. Now researchers are realizing that good readers have, it predicts good reading and possibly you could teach it. So I think this is really important because um, in the phonics world, traditionally, we often talk about 
sort of a formula of getting to be able to well, dear, you just, to decode uh, a word. You have okay. to be able to recognize you just that. Froze on, you're freezing here for a second. Oh, sorry. Did you repeat? No, it's uh, just go ahead and repeat. So in the phonics world, it's really common to think of, of how to attack an unknown word as a formula, learning the letter sounds, then blending those sounds, then you know the word, at least a single syllable word. There We might have some other strategies when we get to multi-syllable words. So that's a very common frame of reference. We think we teach the kids the letter sounds, we teach them how to blend, they're going to read the word. Except now science is making it more clear, there's another strategy. We need to add a third variable. We need to teach them the letter sounds, how to blend, and how to correct mispronunciations. Then they can get the word. And we should expect that. It's not an error in their processing and in, in a sense of the, in their development, it's expected that that you can't really go through this cycle, the, rather through this developmental period of becoming a reader without some of that, because our code is so tricky. EA can be E as in um, blanking on any words to read the book. It can be A as in steak, and it can be E as in, we did a minute ago, as in bread. That is a legitimate possibility when you see EA and you as a new reader can't possibly know what it should be if it's the first exposure to that EA in a given word. And so you need to have the skill of putting those sounds together and having the cognitive flexibility to know that you might have to play around with sounds and words. So this is important in so many different ways. Teachers, we need to have the mindset that I'm going to coach for this strategy, even in the earliest days. You could be teaching your first week of kindergarten and getting kids to read something as silly and simple as a, a cat on a mat. And if they get to the word mat and say mate, or maybe let's do the word cat, and they say, I, I keep coming up with words that can be multiple meanings, but this is how language is, right? Cat, and they say, Kate, it could be, but that doesn't make sense in this our sentence. So then you could tap on that A and say, what else could it be? Because then you're instilling the notion, first of all, that our language, are, and particularly the vowels, can have more than one sound. And you're also instilling a strategy, an attack, an approach to unfamiliar words that will hold that child instead until um, you know he or she's an adult. Because we all come across words that are unfamiliar to us, and we try one pronunciation, and then we try another and that is set for variability. So we can coach it in the earliest days and we, we need to not be afraid of it. Another thing that I think is really relevant for this discussion about the science of reading is I think our decodable texts are really important to getting kids started, but I don't think 100% decodability is serving them. So in reading simplified, we we use what we call mostly decodable text. So we throw, we do want the beginning reader to have a supportive environment so that they can kind of get how the heck this crazy code works. So we start with mostly CVC words where there's a predictable pattern for the consonants and the vowels, but we're going to throw in some things that they haven't been taught, not much, but just a little and the teacher's going to see if the child can do it. And if she can't, the teacher's going to say, well, what else could this be? And maybe if that doesn't work, well, just try ah now. And that from the earliest days helps prepare the child for having that set for variability strategy, which we know, as I mentioned from the beginning, is predictive of good future reading skills. So we we need, I think the research on decodable text is still in, you know, in development. I'd love for for people who are researching this to consider that, you know, that that's a line of, of research that would be interesting to pursue. But as practitioners, uh, I think the evidence suggests that um, the code is easier to figure out if there's some level of decodability and some uh, meaning that the child can make. But we don't have to have 100% decodability for months and months or years and years, because when we do, we're blinding children to the fact that, say, one sound could be more than one, one, um, one spelling, or that two letters could be one sound. Um, a lot of things that happen in kindergarten curricula are setting kids up to not be prepared for set for variability. So we can start them in the earliest days, even when they get to a very long multi-syllable word, 
Uh, maybe they have to play around with the way they chunk that word, break up the syllables. Maybe they have to play around with the vowel, but it starts in the earliest days. And that should be a way of thinking for us as teachers, as we are guiding our kids towards automaticity. Okay. I am going to ask you the favor of uh, giving me the link to that exact blog since we're talking about it. Uh, because I just, when I read that, I just thought, oh my gosh, by the way, when I read that, I thought, oh my gosh, here is a huge piece of potential common ground. And you're going yes. to hear about that during my block yes. uh, over the, uh, the upcoming. Well, week. and I think that's why, I think that's why we get, uh, we miscommunicate a lot of the time uh, and different sides, so to speak is, is, um, we're not we're not up to date on the actual latest science. We're 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 some of the time we're clinging to a paradigm which had some truth in it on either side, but we now have more science and, and both paradigms need to wiggle into the a different position. <laughs> hey, finding common ground. Gosh, what a thought. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that kind of brings us to the, the the final question, which isn't really a question at all. It's just, well, I guess it sort of is. Did Dr. Sam leave anything out that you wanted to talk about, but we haven't? Uh, that's the next question. <laughs> well, I I do think that that is an important, uh, just tra to transition from what we were talking about. Um, that document that I put up about the timeline of research, that is really important to me because I've been frustrated for so many years working with students who came to me in a three queuing environment and they did not have good phonemic awareness. They didn't really understand the code. I taught it to them pretty quickly and then they would get onto grade level and do fine. Um, that was frustrating to me because I realized this was an instructional mismatch for them. Why were they frustrated when it wasn't that hard for them to learn to read? So I'm really passionate about getting that idea out there that we know from science that explicit and systematic phonics instruction is helpful for most students. At the same time, that is a very broad brushwork, brushstroke kind of statement, and it doesn't tell you any nitty gritty about what to do on Monday. There are a lot of ways to go about doing explicit. There's a lot of ways about doing it systematic. And then there are a lot of things we've been learning from science in the last 10, 20, 30 years that shows us um, that it's not 100% systematic, um, rather explicit. It shouldn't be 100% explicit. Uh, and we shouldn't expect to teach our students everything. And I really appreciate how Dr. Mark Seidenberg has been expressing this. The brain needs to have that explicit introduction and we don't know what that amount is. But at some point, most readers learn the rest of the code through implicit uh, practice self-teaching them, as David Scher would say. So we know this through the connectionist models of reading and the machine learning examples there, that the brain is not learning through rules and being taught everything systematically, but it, it it's needed to have some of it introduced very explicitly and then also let it play around, <laughs> let the child go read the words. I like in the reading simplified environment and also in the targeted reading inter in intervention approach, we would be there listening to the kid, let them make the mistakes and actually try to pick a text that would cause them to make mistakes. So they were aiming high and we, and we were aiming high for instructional match. And then we would coach them uh, at, with the least amount of feedback possible. What else could this be? Okay, you can't get it, we'll try O. And those kind of prompts are gonna keep the child's focus on sound-based decoding, which is how they're gonna crack the code, but they're not doing it strictly through phonics. They're using orthography, phonology, and semantics. The th triangle network altogether is what it makes the child successful. So I'm just going a little bit there on one angle of how, um, Research is giving us more information about how the child learns to read that would flesh out some of these um, issues where we've been disagreeing because I'm sure there's many, many a balanced reading teacher who has sat with a child and it's been almost as if the child taught herself. Um, or the ch or you maybe listened to him and gave him occasional um, suggestions, but so much so much happened behind the scenes that that teacher doesn't want to just make that child sit down and do a phonics worksheet. <laughs> so th th that tension is very real um, because we have we had these different paradigms, and some of it I think 
also that's kind of curious to me, I think because we were in a reading war, so to speak, each paradigm really didn't innovate um, in terms of re reading words very much in a way in response to um, to the science. So a lot of traditional phonics programs that developed maybe in the thirties or even earlier, they added on a phonemic awareness patch in the last 20, 30 years, but they didn't really transform the way they organized the code. So at Reading Simplified, we organized the code based on sounds because of that's how the code works, but also the phonological awareness revolution where we realize how much of the code understanding comes through that route of phonemic awareness and processing sounds and symbols. So there's a lot that this is a very complex um, um, issue, but my, I, and I, I think I'm rambling a little bit, but my main message is that the science is very clear about the brain, how the brain learns to read generally, but the specifics um, is still under development and we need to listen to one another and also be aware of what's maybe what was in a program or what we were taught from one side or the other may or not, may not be a specific nuance that's really tied closely to contemporary science. That's still something that's under, under development. And we're at Reading Simplified, we're trying to present the science in a streamlined way, uh, in an innovative way, um, and we keep we keep improving. Hey, well, uh, I'll just semi sum up, summarize here by saying when I do uh, presentations and things, I always say I always want you folks that are listening to the presentation to have something to use on Monday. And I promise everyone in listening to this, if they go to your website. They'll have something to use on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, there's a lot there. And, and so really appreciate that. Um, I'll be interested in what you think of the upcoming blog. By the time this post, uh, it, it will have been out there uh, uh, talking about seeking some common ground. I look forward and, to it. Uh, uh, I guess we now have, re I don't know if you're aware of my final little uh, thing, in my interviews, but the final little thing is a smiling Zoom wave goodbye. Okay, so <laughs> lovely. If you, if you can give me a nice smile and we'll, okay, thank you so much.